Hello, and welcome to the third installment of the I2C 101 Bootcamp Series. I'm Roger Spain. I'm with Warren Avert, a CPA firm with offices throughout the Southeast. I work in our group that provides outsourced accounting services, and I offer that again just so I know, so that you'll have a perspective of where I'm coming from as we go through these discussions. Today, we're going to talk about financial statement issues and complexities. In the first two videos, we talked about financial statements and their basic components. We went through the income statement, the balance sheet, the statement of cash flows, and the notes to the financial statements. Today, we're going to talk about, and this is fairly brief, we're going to talk about issues that relate to financial statements that might be uh, com complex or a little different as non-accountants start thinking more like accountants. And I'm sorry to wish that on anyone, but unfortunately, accounting is the language of, of business. So uh, maybe it's applicable that, that everybody and, and great that everyone can speak it. As we talk about financial statements, let's first recognize that there are certain limitations of financial statements. Financial statements are historical and not necessarily they don't necessarily reflect fair market value. Um, there are some accounting standards that are moving towards fair, fair value or fair market value reporting. However, typically and historically and commonly, financial statements present historical information and they present it in a conservative manner and they present that not necessarily with the intent to reflect fair market value. A great example of this would be if you look at the balance sheet of a company, a snapshot of where the company is and its financial position, it's not necessarily going to show you how much the company's worth. I give you a great example being there may be tremendous value in customer relationships that a company has. That's not reflected as an asset anywhere on the balance sheet. Now, accounts receivable is reflected on the balance sheet where other companies may owe the entity in question money. However, the value of the relationship is not captured or quantified anywhere on the financial statements of the company, other than perhaps to say that it's in the sales activity. But there may be real value in certain customer relationships that's not recorded as an asset for the company. I mentioned conservatism and the other issue that, that relates to financial statements is that it's limited to financial information. Um, a, there is a lot of activity that may go on in a business that is very important relating to operating activities. And the company may measure and capture that in its operating metrics. And that may have a lot to do with the profitability of the company, or it may have a lot to do with its assets. Uh, or its overall value. However, the financial statements are limited to financial information. It's not going to capture some of those other items that may generate goodwill or some of the other important operating metrics of the company that may show that the company's worth a lot because maybe the company has come up with a much better way of doing something and that shows up in its operating metrics but it doesn't necessarily show up in the financial statements. Additional complexities relating to financial accounting and reporting are, there are four that we're gonna go through fairly briefly. The first is cash versus accrual bases of accounting. Um, it's most simple to think of activity within a business on a cash basis. If a company sells something to a customer and the company and the customer pays for it, uh, that's revenue. The company might also have to buy inventory that it's going to be selling. And when it buys the inventory that it's selling, uh, that's a cost of goods sold. That's an expense. But in the real world, business is not necessarily conducted on a cash basis. And that brings into the picture the need for accrual basis accounting. I'll give you several examples to think of very briefly. If instead of selling for cash, the company sells whatever it is that generates revenue. It sold that and the customer is going to pay for that next month. The company then has an account receivable, but that's revenue because the company earned the revenue. It just hasn't collected the cash yet. So instead it has an accounts receivable, which is an asset that, it's, that represents what it's going to be collecting. 
Another example might be the company may pay for its insurance at in, in let's make up a time and say September and that insurance policy is going to run for 12 months. Well, if it paid for three months, you know, 12 months of insurance and it did that three months before the December year end of the company, then the expenses for the insurance represent three months and it has an asset where it is prepaid its insurance for the next year or at least for nine months of the next year. So when it wrote that check for insurance, it actually was incurring writing the check and incurring expense for three months in the current operating year. And it was re it was really uh, generating an asset for prepaid insurance for the next fiscal year. So these are a couple of examples of some of the complexities associated with cash versus accrual based accounting. We're probably going to spend a little bit more time discussing this. There's another video coming where we're going to get into some of the nitty gritty of actually how to prepare financial statements. And we're going to talk about, unfortunately, we're going to have to talk about debits and credits and how all of that works. But we'll save that for the next video. So hang with me. And then if you want to dread that, you can dread the next video. So so we'll we'll get there, but but we'll spare you for one more video. Another issue relating to financial statement complexities is non-operating transactions. Uh, in many cases, uh, companies do have non-operating transactions. And to distinguish between the two, an operating transaction would be the sales that I was just referring to, where a company sells something and it has cost of sales where it acquires the inventory and then it sells that inventory. Those are operations. Uh, or if it's a service company, it generates revenue and it incurs payroll to pay for the people that are providing the service. Those are operating activities. Non-operating activities um, might include things that are outside of the normal operations of the company. Uh, so let's let's use something such as buying equipment. That's not really part of the day-to-day -day operations of the company, but it's still part of conducting the affairs of the company. But those transactions are not as simple and straightforward as simply buying inventory and selling inventory. So just know that as we start moving into more complex issues, we're going to be talking about more and more things that are more difficult to think about in terms of where they fit on financial statements and how to record those. But non-operating activities have to be accounted for somehow if they've been paid for or, or have generated a liability by the company. But those are, are different from operations, obviously, in the way we handle those. The next is capital structure accounting. If someone makes an investment of the company in the company, that is not an expense of the company. It puts capital or usually cash into the company and it also increases the equity in the company. Um, we could refer to capital structure or include in that debt as well. If we go to the bank and borrow money, then we're getting cash and we're probably buying equipment or something like that with that. So we're getting an asset that's going into the company and we're incurring debt with a bank. Well, that, act, that transaction doesn't go on the income statement anywhere. That that shows up in our balance sheet because it affects the financial position of the company because we're talking about increasing assets and either increasing third party claims, bank debt on those assets, or if it was an equity infusion, that's residual equity that that the owners of the company have against the total assets of the company. And we talked about that in the first video. Lastly, I want to talk to you about understanding how the year end closeout works. And I'm actually, I may switch over in just a moment and, and, and walk through and try to demonstrate how this works. But I want you to think about the fact that when we talk about a company and its income statement and the fact that it has income and it has expenses and then hopefully net income and not net loss, but hopefully net income at the end of the year, at the end of the year, that income statement reflects activity for that year. And so we're going to start all over again next year. We're going to start with zero balances in the income statement again next year because the first dollar we earn in the next year is dollar one. So we'll start from scratch each year as we record income statement activity. What do we do with the net income from the last year? 
Well, in the most simplistic of scenarios, let's assume that the money that the company made in net income stayed in the company and that became an asset of the company. It had net income, it, the net income stayed in the company, it became cash or an asset in the company. In that case, that asset of cash that stayed in the company isn't owed to anyone else. It's not owed to a third party. It's really there for the owner to claim. It's equity that the owner can claim. In order to illustrate how we close out the income statement each year, we're going to look at how an income statement is closed out and how that net income amount will effectively move over into the balance sheet as a part of this year end closeout. So if we review very quickly, we remember on the balance sheet that assets equal liabilities and owner's equity. And generally assets will carry a debit balance to increase them and liabilities and equity both carry credit balances as claims against those assets and the two will equal as we've talked about in the accounting equation in previous videos. We also know in the income statement and we've discussed this in previous videos as well that an income statement shows revenue which we credit revenue when we when we receive revenue and then we reduce that by expenses which carry a debit balance as we recognize expenses and that yields net income which if we have net income versus a net loss for the year that will carry a credit balance because that will mean that revenues were greater than expenses with revenues carrying the credit balance and therefore net income will also carry that credit balance. This becomes important in just a moment as we'll talk about this example. In our previous example, we talked about a business that might operate for a year and make a profit of $110 throughout its year. If that's the case, at the end of the year, the company has generated net income of $110. And let's, in this example, as we talked about a moment ago, assume that we, we as the owner, left that money in the business. And therefore, over here on the balance sheet, We've got $110 of cash that is an asset that represents the money we made throughout the year as revenues brought in more money than we spent on expenses by an amount of $110, which is the same as the net income. So that generated cash in this very simplest example of net income of $110 and cash of $110. Well, it's now the end of the year and it's time to close out the income statement so that we can zero out all of the balances so we can start recording another year of activity. Well, at the end of the year, we made $110 as we just discussed and that generated cash or assets of $110. And who, to who does that $110 belong? Well, it belongs to the owners of the company. It becomes owner's equity. So at the end of the year, we're going to take this $110 of net income that we made and we're, and we're going to move it over into the balance sheet where we record that as the owner's claim against that $110 of cash of $110. And that represents the net income for the period just ended that the owner decided to leave in the company and therefore it increased cash or assets by $110. And since the owner is the one who generated that and left the money in and it's not owed to anyone else, we have also increased owner's equity by the same $110. Again, that's a very simplistic example to show how it is that we close out the income statement and move the net income over into the balance sheet as a component of owner's equity. Hope this helps.